63 years, Mary Wilson Davis, five children, Gail Owens of East Ridge, Tennessee, Lavonda Lines of Callahan, Florida, Terry Davis of Terry uh, and Cynthia Davis of Trenton, Florida, Priscilla Holbrook of Callahan, Florida, Steve Davis of East Ridge, Tennessee, 10 grandchildren and 13 great grandchildren, and several nieces and nephews. There is no way that the uh, International Office of the Church of God could ever know all that happened in a man's ministry. That's right. But each month he was faithful in sending in a report of activities. And here is a summary of what we have. He was uh, first licensed at age 23. He became an exhorter January 18, 19, uh, 1957. He became an ordained minister July 8, 1957. He became an ordained bishop June 7, 1972. He preached 3,911 sermons. There were converted under his influence of his ministry 1,027. There were 446 sanctified. There were 471 filled with the Holy Ghost. There was 831 baptized in water and added to the church 696. And I will tell you this. If every minister in the church of God was only half as fruitful in ministry as this man, Oh, yes. The church would be much larger than what it is today. Amen. So I want to, th I want to thank God for his faithfulness. Yes. Many times when going to a funeral or participating in a funeral, I try to think of one word that would describe the person. And for Brother Davis, that word would be faithful. Yes. You know, some people talk about people being spiritual. I've been thinking about that a lot here lately. In fact, not too long ago, I called my uncle. He lives down in uh, Alabama, North Alabama, in Massive Community. And Uncle Tom was the one that invited me to church the night I got saved. And I got a few weeks ago and uh, called him. He's 92 years old now. And I said, Uncle Tom, I just want to call him and tell you, first of all, that I love you. And I'm going to have prayer with you before we complete this call. But I will thank you for being faithful. Yes. I said, I doubt very seriously if you would fit into what some people would call spiritual. Because a person that is spiritual, they get out in the aisle or they make a lot of outward expressions of praise and worship. They dance in the spirit. They sing in the spirit. They run in the spirit. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody run in the spirit. But I said, you know, probably you would not qualify in some people's mind as being spiritual. But I said, I've come to this conclusion. Probably took me a few years to reach this point, but I've come to this conclusion. There's nothing that you could do, ever do, that's more spiritual than being faithful. Amen. Just being faithful. Yes. I've heard of two preachers talking one day, and one of them said to the other one, said, you know, he said, I've got a man in my church. He, he 
never misses a service. I mean, if the doors are open, he's there. And he said, you can't put your finger on his life. He lives above reproach. Pays his time to the people. He said, I've just got one problem with him. He's not spiritual. <laughs> when I heard that, I thought, well, I've had a lot of members I'd have traded for him. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I've had showers and aisle runners and downers. In fact, I'd have probably given about 10 or 20 to 1. <laughs> to get a man that lives above reproach. Yes. Faithful to church. Faithful in finance. That, my friend, is spiritual. So today, we're celebrating the homegoing of a man that was spiritual. Glory. Faithful to God. Yes. Faithful to the church. Faithful to his wife. Faithful to his family. Yes. And faithful to his friends. Yes. Glory. He just had one problem. I don't know if I should mention this today or not, but he had an addiction. <clears throat> and, you know, the word addiction is kind of a terrible word in our society because people are addicted to so many things. Yes. To drugs, to alcohol, right. to pornography. But when I think about this man, and especially after hearing about his last days, weeks, and months in the nursing home, I think of a scripture that said, For ye know of the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruit of a chaos. That they have addicted themselves right. to the ministry of the saints. That's right. So he was addicted. Yes, he was. To the ministry. Glory. Hallelujah. He lived his life loving, serving, worshiping, witnessing. And when it came down to the very end, he left this world doing all that he could to bring others to Jesus. So I want to thank you today. And what a wonderful family, beautiful family. What a wonderful one, faithful companion. I can tell you this. He would have never been able to accomplish all that he was accomplishing that had not been for his faithful companion. Yes, Amen. You know, they say that behind every successful man, there's a faithful wife. I heard someone say that behind every successful man, there is a surprise mother. <laughs> but I want to tell you today that I, I honor this man. Yes. And I hold him in the highest esteem. Yes. Right. Amen. Because he was faithful. Yes. Glory. <laughs> Oh, I have 
standing by Raymond because it makes me feel like a run. <laughs> I do bring greetings from two ministers, Raymond Franklin, Joe Bass, has passed away now. But Franklin wanted to be here, but his wife had just gotten out of a cancer surgery and just didn't feel like he could leave her. He called me and pleaded and begged, please tell two stories. I promised him I would, and now that they are putting this on the stream and the live, I better tell it. I won't tell you this, Raymond, Brother Franklin. <laughs> Brother Franklin and uh, Brother Joe Bass were kind of like sidekicks to Daddy when he passed from North Manhattan. Daddy was very instrumental and helping these two men get into the ministry. He basically mentored these men. And they got into this thing of going mother fishing. I mean, they just love going mother fishing. And um, Brother Bass, he called my dad and says, uh, Brother Davis, me and Brother Franklin are going to come by and pick you up. We're going to fish it early this morning. And uh, Dad said, he knew it was cold. He knew it was cold. And Dad said, Brother Bass, I just don't think I'll be able to get out today. I'm not feeling the best. So Brother Bass said, okay. So he tells Brother Franklin. He says, Brother Franklin, Brother, ba uh, Brother Davis is not feeling well. And uh, he's just kind of feeling under the weather. So Brother Franklin said, well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go by and, and, and pray for our pastor. Well, an hour or so rolls by, and he gets there, and they knock on the door, and I don't know who answered the door. They walk in to thank him, Dad, was in the bed sick. And Brother Franklin said, to my surprise, he had about nine pancakes on his plate getting ready to eat breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> this is before he had his surgery. <laughs> Brother Franklin said to Dad, I thought you were sick, Pastor. He said, well, son, I just really felt like this would help me. <laughs> <laughs> really felt like it would help me. <laughs> Another time, they were going mullet fishing. Brother Franklin had to work that day, and my dad, for the bass, they went out and uh, was doing some mullet fishing, but they were so... The fish were a little bit too far for the cast net to reach. And Brother Franklin had told Dad, said, Pastor, any time you want to borrow the boat, you feel free just to come and get it. It's in the front door. <laughs> Several months has gone by after you make that statement. And Brother Bash was about to give up on catching his mother. Well, you got to catch him on the run, you know. And Daddy says, no, no, we're not going to give up. Brother Franklin said, I can borrow his boat anytime I want it. They left that fishing hole and went to the front yard and got that boat. Unbeknownst to Brother Franklin, he has no idea. He's at work. He comes home about an hour later and he says, oh my, somebody has stole my boat. <laughs> so what does Brother Franklin do? He gets on the phone and calls the police department. <laughs> He said, my boat has been stolen. He gave them the tag number. He gave them the uh, 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 name of the boat. And uh, so they put an APB out. So now the police are going to these fishing holes that Brother Franklin says, well, maybe there's some holes out here. And he didn't know what was going on. So the police are out looking for this boat, not knowing Daddy had took his boat. And about an hour or so after that, here comes Daddy and him pulling the boat back to the front door. He said, oh, Brother Davis, I have just called the police about an hour ago, and they're out looking for you because I said somebody stole my boat. <laughs> he said, son, you told me I could borrow it any time. He said, well, at least you call me and tell me. <laughs> and so they had the police out looking for that, but uh, they didn't arrest him because they didn't run the boat back. He said, we're still on the boat. He felt guilty. But uh, they asked me if I would share a few of these things and uh, let you know. I'm honored to 
stand here today in behalf of my father. Oh, yes. He was a mentor. Yes, sir. A mentor. Yes, he was. Brother Rice couldn't have said it any better, Brother Rice. He was addicted. He was so hooked on it. He said, I've got to have another fix. I've got to have, I've got to have a word from God. He was yes. just so obsessed Hallelujah. with preaching the gospel and reaching the lost. Right, right. My dad very seldom took me fishing or hunting. And I found out later on years. And he said, if I could do it all over again, I would change it. But he said, son, I love ministry so bad, and I thought I had to reach the world. And I didn't take time with my own son. And I said, dad, that's okay. He had good intentions. And my dad was a true man of God. Amen. He lived what he preached. He was really a giant in my eyes. And then since his passing, and while he was in a nursing home and getting senile and Alzheimer's, I would say something to dad about the church. And he's like, what do you mean, church? So I lost my dad several years ago. But I don't want to go to heaven for it. Right. Yeah. Amen. I mean, dad, don't look at me and say, come on, son, just brag on me some more. Yeah. I love my dad. Yes. And we're going to miss him. It's not going to be many days hence. Right. We're going to be with Jesus. That's right. right. My Father. Oh, glory to God. I'm looking so forward to that. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, and I just thank God today for oh, yes. what he means to me. One, one little uh, story, in fact, Brother Rice shared this. About a, I believe it was Brother Rice, years ago. About a retired minister that was sitting out on his rocking chair just rocking away. And see, I know my dad loved preaching more than he did fishing because he done a whole lot more preaching than he did fishing. That was just a sign. Thank you, God. This old retired minister was sitting there in his rocking chair rocking, and a young pastor comes up to him and says, Brother, how are you doing? He said, Well, I'm doing all the best I can. He said, It must be nice. It must be nice. To be retired. You can go fishing anytime you want to. Come and go as you please. Trying to encourage the retired minister. The old retired minister will be in the week. What did I say? The young man thought, what did I say to hurt his feelings? He said, son, you don't understand. He said, when I get that burning desire to want to preach another message. Right. And I'm weak and I'm feeble and I'm unable to do that. Right. What do I do with that fire that shuts in my bones? And I think of my father. Yes. About six weeks ago, Dad, knowing it's real, I'll never doubt the power of God and the reality of what God can do in our lives. And the Nursing home ladies, they turned on some gospel music for dad and just kind of let him into his cell. And they walked down the hallways back and forth. All of a sudden, one of the nurses saw daddy's little hands about six weeks ago. Tears running down his face. They just loved Jesus. Glory to God. And that nurse, they got a whole slew of nurses, and they said, you've got to see this. This is special. This is special. Look at this man. In his condition, he's got little hands up, loving Jesus, and tears streaming down his face. Oh, glory. Brother Ross, I couldn't help but think my dad was addicted. Oh, yes. He said, i got to have it. Just six weeks before he passes. And I thank God that I can stand here and I have to make that story stop my head. They're true stories. That's right. He was a man I can look up to. Yes. You didn't have to have a dictionary to find out what you're saying. Uh, I'll tell you that now. You didn't have to have a dictionary. He meant what he said, he said what he meant. Right. And when right. you walked away from that conversation, you didn't have to figure to scratch your head. What was he saying? No. Dad was a very good man that loved people. But he told it like it was. And I think, I think 
I really believe this world still wants somebody to tell the truth. Right, right. We sugarcoated this gospel for so long. I don't want to preach, but we sugarcoated this gospel for so long that we pack people in the back of their simple lifestyle, and it's like we don't have no one to look up to. Anything goes. But I wish to God we could have some more ministers, and he's not the only one, there's many out there, that would just preach it, tell it like it was. Yeah. And I am so glad that I've got a father before me that's beckoning me on home. He's waiting. His body may be there, but his spirit's gone. Yeah. And I just thank God thank you. for my father. Yes. We're going to ask the grandchildren, they're going to come up and they're going to get ready to uh, sing a special song in honor of my dad. It's entitled Peace in the Valley. My mom and my dad sang that song, Peace in the Valley. Yes. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy it. And uh, if you just want to stand and worship, you can do that. Oh, yes. If you just want to stand and yes. worship, Lord, you can do that. Yes. Can I do something just before Dr. Rick is saying? Just stand out where you're at. There, there's just something that I have never seen done at a funeral home. Never. Or a funeral service. But I believe Dad was so addicted to his calling that would, would anybody have any objection if Dad would like to maybe give us a clip of a preaching moment? That's how addicted he was. Just a, just a clip of Daddy preaching. Can, can we make that happen? Let's see if we can't make that happen. Hey, look, come on, That's my dad. You know, you look at it, I'm going to go over here. You know, you keep getting caught in the church, you go there, hey, then you take everybody in the church, you know, Amen. You can keep them quiet. They come, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, praise God. I mean, I've raised them to the church of God. I've been all my life. I've been close to them. Amen. That's where I was raised. Mama made me go. I didn't want to go where I was raised. But Mama said, you go. Amen. Praise God. I get out and go let go. I sit in all the temples and come to say, I can't go see the world. She just kept on praying. She just kept on getting a hold of God. Praise God, one day God got a hold of me. Why? Because Mama, amen. I can remember those people. They used to stop. They pray. They thank you back. Oh, I know the Pentecost of God. Oh, we're going to act like Pentecost. We need to come alive. Thank you. We ought to get close to the Pentecost of God. Because we fired us and scared us for us. We need to come alive for God. Don't let a God have a new. Thank God I get to set the tide. He didn't hear I told the preacher's Bible. He said people sit there. He said they set sour and they set something sour. <laughs> Praise God. 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 I got caught that dropping and crumbling in the plane. He got on the table. It's time to get 
when we come to take our wisdom and the pains and wounds of our lady back, can you imagine tonight if there were all of us standing in the house of glory? Come on. 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 Come on.
is his son and by the law. <laughs> I'm the one he tried his best to run off. He told me that. Sitting in the church one night when my wife then was about 15 years old, I made the mistake of letting my hand slip off the pew and touch her shoulder. <laughs> he met me after church and you know, he wanted to say to me, basically, you need to give God your heart and your soul. The rest of you belongs to me. <laughs> he said, just for the record, since she don't belong to you, you keep your hand off of her shoulder there in church. Do you understand me, son? <laughs> I understand it. Yes. Yes, sir. And I still understand it. <laughs> a time or two, we were cutting the crazy. Terry and I were friends and I was dating and I was finding every excuse in, in the world to be at the house and so I was over there courting. They call it dating now. We sit on the front living room couch and we got to tussle. Mom and them was hollering at us. Y'all quit it. Well I got the advantage of the big old man at that time. He weighed about 296 pounds at that time and I got on top and I had me a death grip on him and my arm around him and I was going to whip him and hold him down. Show him who this new man of the house is going to be. And by the time I thought I had him real good, he opened up his mouth and thought my underarm here was a muscle or a steak. <laughs> and he let in to take him the biggest bite of that steak in the world. <laughs> I got off of him. <laughs> and for the record, say I never got back on him again. <laughs> he meant he was winning that one. When he set his mind to do something, he was going to do it. He always purposed to never ask for a change unless he was going to a church that was down. He said, my God, son, I never got a promotion. He said, I like them. I like to take them when they're at the bottom and bring them back to the top. He knew he was going to do that. In one of our churches in Tampa, one of the district churches, the largest church in there, he set a goal one day to have more in church than they did. And he did. And he called him the Monday morning after and said, How many did you have yesterday? He told him, he said, Well, you need to get on the ball. So we had more than you had. <laughs> he loved his calling. He loved the work of God. He would preach and everyone might not understand his language or he might not say it like Lavanda would want him to say it. <laughs> Lavanda was his, always his grammar corrected. He'd, she'd say, Daddy, you shouldn't say it like that. You should say it like this. And she would tell him. He'd look at her and his little head walk and say, did you understand me? <laughs> and she said, yes, sir. Well, that's all the <laughs> Praise God. I asked him about marrying his daughter. I said, can I marry your daughter? And he just looked at me and said, I thought better over a steak. <laughs> I said, so what's the answer? He said, you didn't hear me? I thought better over a steak. I said, well, let's get a baby to go to a steak somewhere. Let's get us a steak. Then he said something like this. How are you going to take care of a dog? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> well, have you got the rent figured out? You got the car payment figured out? Come back to me when you got these things figured out. <laughs> and we did. We was at a western system. He eat the finest steak he wanted. And I said to him then, I think I've got most of this thing figured out. He said, what is it? I love her. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever it takes, I'll see that she's taking care of. All right, I guess we'll do this thing. And he loved me. He took me in as a son. Oh, yes. When Brother Rice was talking about the statistics of what was saved under his ministry, he has not even touched that because whatever was saved under my ministry, is as right. S.J. Davis' ministry. Right. Right. That's right. And every one of the preachers that were called to God under him, you've got to add that too. Because yes. he mentored yes. us. Oh, God. And his legacy will continue in our lives. Yes. Preparing the service for today, they were asking around in different places what we should do. I said, I think it's only right that his son, Terry, lead this thing. And his son, Steve and the ministers of his family, myself, stand and declare what he has done in our lives, the yes. impact he has had in our lives. Yes. 
I remember preaching a revival in Immokalee, Florida, and when I was there, I thought I was doing good. The revival was going great. We were having these hallelujah shouting times. And there was two ministers there, the pastor there and another minister on the district that were at odds against each other. And I heard one say this about the other, and I thought, well, this can't be right. I'm new now to this. I've not preached a whole lot. And so I'm doing this revival the best I knew how to do. And I thought, well, the minister that he was talking about had invited me to his house to eat the next day, so I went to eat with him. And I made a mistake of saying, do you know this preacher I'm preaching for? He, he thinks this about you? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know. He said, well, what, what does he? I said, yeah. I said, well, we come to revival now. We had our Holy Ghost still time. I'll never forget the shouting time. These were walking around the walls. That minister got up and went up to the other minister. So I didn't know I, I had this against you and all this, that, and the other. And he said, well, you know, I never said that. I said, oh, my goodness, what have I started now? <laughs> they called me into the rally. And on a Friday night, right at the end of the altar service, he said, you told him I said this? I said, I did. You did tell me that. I did not. I said, oh, my goodness, what have I been to now? He said, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you can close this revival and leave tomorrow. I said, no, sir, I'm leaving tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I packed up and headed home, got home today, whining on his shoulder, just whining. He said, well, son, you have no business getting in their business. <laughs> I said, but then he said, no, listen here. If you ever see two preachers that odd, they said, get, keep your nose out of there and leave them alone. You know, he didn't, I, I, I'm thinking he ought to be petting me a little bit. No, no, no. He said, I ain't even standing at my own young and say, wrong. you're wrong. Stay out of it. Go cry somewhere and get up and go and I did that. I tell you this here, I ain't talking about no two, two preachers. They got problems, I'll leave them alone. <laughs> Amen, brother. I'll leave them alone. A lot of these small lessons, yes, he taught us. Yes, he did. Through a lifestyle. Yes. Sir. I don't know the times I've heard him call Raymond and James' his name out. By saying, he said, Mama, they're lost. At times they were lost, they were out of fellowship. And he said, I gotta call them, I gotta check on my nephews. Oh, yes. I, I, this is the kind of man he was. He called and checked on people. He had a passion for them. Early in the morning he was praying. Late in the evenings, night times, he was praying. He was interceding. He loved to have church. I believe Gail mentioned that earlier. He didn't like slow songs. Whenever I was first called, I was in Germany. As a young military boy, I came home. I married his daughter. I was trying to be a preacher. I was trying to play the piano. And I could play because he lived with four fingers. Da, 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 da. And I'd practice those four finger play. And he'd say, and I don't mean to be offensive to any denomination, so don't take offense at this what I'm going to say. He said, Son, can't you play something else? That bad this music is killing me. <laughs> no offense, man. He said, That's killing me. It hurt my little feelings, but I still wanted to play the piano. I'd get a little better. Get a little better. Get a little better. Until I was honored one day, he said, Son, would you play this song for me? I said, Woo! I'm getting, I'm getting great. I'm getting great. He just wanted to have church. He wanted to have church. And I'm glad to know him as my father in law. And he will often refer to me as Sister Davis' son in law. And that's, it. that's your son in law. But he loved me as much as he loved anyone of his children. Yes, he did. He loved me. He loved to work. He loved to get in the car and the truck and go with me whenever I was passing and he was retired. He'd say, Mama, I'm going to the Where are you going? I don't know. You never know when you're where you go when you go with him. <laughs> you're going to start here, but he said, We'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> a go, a work, a man of God, a man of faith that instilled within us. We could call and ask him questions, and he had, he seemed to have the right answer. Didn't take a Philadelphia lawyer, just a few couple, just a couple words. And I'm glad to know him as my father in law. And I'm glad to be able to stand here and say that. And I've never said a whole lot. I'm not, I'm not the judge. I'm not the one who makes the decisions. There's one who has the right, and that's Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. I've often been asked, you know, to preach people's funerals and, and tell them they were in heaven. And I said, I can't do that. I don't have the right to do that. My old nephew was shot and killed in, just out of Tampa, Florida, Pasco County, by a deputy sheriff. My sister called me in the wee hours of the morning asking me to check on her son in the Tampa General Hospital. When I got there, he was dead. 24 years 
ago and she called me. She said, she said, Elder, will you tell everybody that Earl Dimes in heaven? And uh, I broke up and I said, sis, I don't have that right. I said, I don't have that right. Well, he, 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 he answered me in the hospital and he told me this. I said, I still don't have that right. He died in 1.8 drunk. I don't have that right to say that. Brother Scott that's on the platform here, he helped me with that funeral. And he made a statement that I've never forgot. He said, Earl knew how to pray. Oh, yes. We knew he knew how to pray. And then Brother Scott said, the mercies of God are everlasting. His mercies are new every day. We just pray that Earl did call on God. But I believe, if I know anybody, man, what I believe this man here lived, what he preached to others. All right. And I told Mother the first words I said to Mother after I called and talked to her. She was, they were at Cracker Barrel eating, and she was crying. I said, Mother, can't you hear him now? I said, the moment he stepped on the streets of gold, he hollered at Jesus, Let's see! <laughs> Anybody ever heard him say that? Let's see! Let's see! Praise God. Hallelujah. No more club-footedness, no more stumbling. Praise God. I can see him making a little shout, a little bald head with jerky. He didn't spin around. I can see him worshiping and magnifying God, saying, Let's eat. <laughs> what are y'all waiting on? Let's eat. That fishing story, I thought Terry was going to tell y'all about the fishing story about where they went fishing one night after church on Sunday night. He would not go fishing on Sunday. Amen. 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 He wouldn't go fishing, but at 1201, he'd go fishing. <laughs> well, on one that Sunday night, they went mother fishing. They caught a mess of mother. Come home at 2 o'clock in the morning. He th he's hollering as he comes through the door. Mama! Mama! What? Get up. Get the grease off. We're going to snatch the britches off of them. <laughs> oh. oh, daddy. Come on, get the grease off. We're going to snatch the britches off. We're going to have them in here just a minute. <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning. Fried mother. Early Monday morning. Uh, Submissive wife. Submissive wife. Yes, yes. yes. Her daughters that knew all about this said, Daddy, we hate you for that. Won't you let Mama rest? Well, she get enough rest. Come on, cook them fish. <laughs> Terry and I was with Dad one time. We were just young looker snappers, and we thought we were we were the hottest thing ever since Kenny Athens. We just was it. And he had his truck, his Ford truck painted a teal color, almost to cover these spots here. He was proud of that truck. He said, come on, boys, let's go down to West Lumber and get us a piece of plywood and put it in the back and protect the paint. You remember that, Terry? <laughs> he said, y'all boys pick it up and put it in the truck. Well, I go pay for it. Three-quarter inch plywood. He comes out as we're, we had just set it on the edge of the tailgate and just grabbed the other end and just slid it in. <laughs> He said, you jarheads, <laughs> you toe-headed youngins, I can't wait till y'all get y'all a new truck and I'm going to slide it in y'all. <laughs> Why don't I have this truck? <laughs> Praise God. We're just going to get here. <laughs> We've watched our trucks when we got them. <laughs> Dad was right. What a day. What a day. We're honored today to have special guests here with us, ministers that he knew, ministers we would love to hear him tell the stories. Brother Branson was one of those. He would talk about Brother Branson in Winter Garden, and he'd say every Monday morning we'd get together, and he'd say, look, Jackie, let's go to the milkshake. He said, okay, we'd go down to the milkshake place. He said, well, I don't have no money, Jackie. Brother Branson, would you come and make a comment or two here? I just set the platform right up for you. Some of you other ministers, I want you to play and have something here in just a minute to say. Some of you others, I want to give you a chance to come and say something today. God bless you. It's an honor of mine to think about a friend of mine. When you think about faithfulness, no greater things than to have a friend. Jack Davis, or Jackie Davis, was a friend. Praise the Lord. Amen. He pastored his first church in Oakoy, Florida. I was 
pastor of the Winter Garden. In 1956, building the church around the house that they were worshiping in. And of course, I had the privilege of helping him build that church because he called you. He said, Come help me today. If what you're doing, I'd go help him. We was putting the rafters up and then putting the gable in on that church in Okoy. And I had overalls on. We was putting the gable in and I was sitting on the lean to scaffold, <laughs> nailing those nails in to get those, the gable end in. And that scaffolding come out the money. And just like I was sitting on that scaffolding, I sat on the ground. And when I sat on the ground, my overalls decided they couldn't contain me. <laughs> and when he saw my overalls, Bursted. He just had to laugh. Before he could ever say, Are you hurt or not? He had to laugh at me. But talking about then uh, the milkshakes, he was always up early. Monday morning, he'd come by where we were living in the back of the church at that time, the Winter Garden. He'd knock on the door, and I didn't get up to service, he did. He said, you ready to go? I said, where are we going? He said, we're getting out. We're going to do something today. Which every Monday, that was our time together. Monday morning, he'd come and knock on my door. So we'd head down toward Orlando. And there was a milkshake place between Winter Garden and Orlando. And he said, ah, there's our milkshake place. We're going to have one. We pulled in there. I said, well, Jack, I said, uh, you woke me up before I could get my check to the bank this morning. And I said, I don't have any money. He said, oh, I'll pay for it. So we go in and have a milk check. Next week or so, here we go. Monday morning, first thing. Prison, where are you? I'm getting up. I said, get out of bed and come on. We're going to go. Get out of here. So we get out and go and come by the milk check place. He said, Got to get a milkshake. I said, okay. I said, but I don't have any money. I haven't been to the milkshake. That's the rest of the story. <laughs> Part two. It went by several weeks gone by now. And we'd gone by that milkshake place and we stopped that morning. And he said, now wait a minute. He said, I've been buying all the milkshakes. <laughs> he said, you've got to start getting that check cash. He said, you're going to pay for them today. <laughs> uh, I didn't know how long he was going to pay for milkshakes. <laughs> uh, it, 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 we just had a great time together. And after that, he went, uh, after he left Okoye with the, I believe, LaBelle, if I remember right. But anyway, he was building on the church, and he called me one day and said, Bridget, said, I put a roof on this church, and said, I need somebody to help me lift these rafters like you did with Okoye. And I said, okay. So I went down and kept him on that church. Then we went to the General Assembly. I don't want to take up too much time. I can tell you a lot of stories. We went to the General Assembly. One year we took our vacations, Mary and Jack and Dorcas and I and my wife. Wanted to go by first Pennsylvania, her granddad's house. And I just, uh, you know, got one of them real good Cadillacs. I thought. My members wanted me to get a Cadillac. I said, you need a Cadillac. And it's the worst lemon I ever had. <laughs> we had something going on with it every day. But we headed to Pennsylvania and got to her granddad's house. And they fixed the meal. And in Pennsylvania, he said, have you ever eaten groundhog? I said, no, I'm going to eat groundhog. I said, but we got some today. So if Mary's ate my first, uh, her granddad's in Pennsylvania ate my first groundhog oh. to try it out. I don't know, that might have been the last time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we went on, we just had a great time together. We went in after the General Assembly. We went on out even to Denver, Colorado. 
on that trip and come back and just had a great time. But let me tell you this, as we started out, that was the first car that either one of us had owned that had air conditioning in it, even living in Florida. And when we started out up close to, uh, well, just out of uh, town in good ways, there's a little a nice lake on the side and some young people out there swimming in that lake, and now we put children swimming in summertime. And uh, Mary looked at them and saw said, ah, goodness, Look at them kids up there swimming and how cold it is. <laughs> then you have to think, I'm an air-conditioned car. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we had some great times together. Yes. Not only was he a faithful, yes. God-called, God-ordained, loving minister, but he's a friend that, yes. that we all love, too. And he loved yes. us. Yes. God bless the family. We love you all. Amen. Amen. Clayton Trevor, another close friend of his, and they had some great times. I don't want to talk about his, his fast car or how fast they get through the general assembly. What? <laughs> it's a delight to be here to share on behalf of the family and friends of S.J. Davis. But uh, I remember the beginning of this church here. Van Riggs, that's done most of the masonry part of all of this building that you see around here. And uh, we started, Van called me and said, uh, I've uh, found some property for sale. He was coming down the road. He saw a sign for sale out there, and so he picked me up. And we came down, parked out there, and looked at it. And I said, well, Van, we need to, we need to get that if we can. I said, I've talked for an Altman before and stayed over here. He said, we need a church in that area. So uh, I brought him over here and he looked at it and said, it's good. And I said, there's four, well, I don't know how many, 25 acres we have here now. And the man said, we went over there to talk to the owner. And the uh, man went in and negotiated with him. He said, uh, he'd take $16,500 for this property. Miracles started happening, you know, and uh, we got the property and pitched a ten out here, and uh, Brother Davis got a, a, a trailer put back here, a house trailer, to live in until we get started, but you know, he never would uh, say, well, this has been accomplished, this is the end, no, we've got to continue to do it, so we started pouring concrete, laying blocks, and all of that, but while we were doing it, we needed some funds, and he announced a barbecue down at the Hickson Utility Building where we would meet and have a fundraiser. So uh, he called me up and he said, son, he said, I want you to come down here. I've got a couple of hogs and some Boston butts and we're going to barbecue. So we went up there and we built our pit and, and had everything going and we had those Boston butts and hogs and, and hogs laid out there and big shoulders and hams and I mean, they were just smoking good, and they were doing good. And he said, son, it's going to be nice tonight. Well, there's an overcast. And uh, he had a horse out there, a quarter horse. Terry would ride him. And every time he'd get through, well, they, the horse was trained to come through the gap. And uh, Terry would take his bridle off and tie him up out there, whatever. And so uh, we were standing out there. The S.J. said, Terry, said, go get the trigger and saddle him up. said, show Clayton how he can run. And Terry did. And Terry went up on the hill and came down through there. He called him back and said, son, get off that horse. and let me show him how to make it run. <laughs> you have to understand, he's still, and this is before he lost all of his weight. <laughs> he's on that. He had a little hat, a little derby hat, you know. Uh, like the Kentucky Dirt, had it on. So he went up through there, and uh, I said, he's walking slowly, and Terry said, yeah, he's checking the fence line. So he was. He went way up on the hill. And I'm standing down there about halfway, standing pretty close to the hogs. And he comes, and he's stretched out. I mean, that horse is running, and, and I have just enough knowledge to know that horse 
it's not going to stop. <laughs> Man, he hit that. There was always a wet spot in the gap, you know. And he hit that, and when he did, that horse went through there. And they tore down the new bob wire, tore down the gate, <laughs> and the horse on top of him. And then <laughs> Terry runs down there, and he says, Has, Is Trigger hurt? <laughs>
got there, of course, you know, everybody tells you what Pop Davis did. I already knew that he was a legend there at Cluiston. But they tell you about, you know, he had it on here, he had it on here, he done this here. The fellowship hall is, is designed with an L shape because of a tree that couldn't get cut down. They tell you all these different things that would go on. And uh, we had the privilege of selling the church and relocating and in the cell. We, the church, the new church, is 12,888 square feet. The first part that we built was 3,029 square feet. The next part, we sold that one, great fundraiser for the church, sold that one, built a new, new part, 3,857 feet. So we built right at 20,000 square feet. Of course, everything, we sold everything that Brother Davis had ever had it on to and built these new, new facilities. And the greatest compliment that I've ever received in my life Brother Tatum stood up. Brother Tatum stood up and he cried and he said, you know, how much he loved us and how much he appreciated. And I knew Brother Tatum thought the world of Brother Davis. But no matter how many square feet, 20,000 square feet, but I could never fill two feet. We relocated, got everything, but there was one guy who was such a legend at Cluiston Church of God and still will ever be a legend, and that's Brother S.J. Davis. He was loved, he was honored, he was respected. And it is a privilege of my life for him to say, Son, you remind me so much of myself. And a lot of people say, Where did you learn all your building? Where did you get all that from? And it came from S.J. Davis. He taught me to not whine about anything, but to get to work. And I love this famous saying he had. He could not stand sidewalk superintendents. Amen. God bless you. Chancy. I've had the privilege of uh, pastoring the Salmon Set Church of God for the last seven years. And uh, Brother Davis pastored there. Uh, when many people refer to the, the, the glory days, I guess, of Salmon Set. And um, so many people uh, from our church would have loved to have been here uh, today, but they do send their condolences to the family. And, uh, Brother and Sister Davis has left such a mark in everywhere they've been. And uh, it's, I never was under the direct ministry of, of Brother Davis, but I remember a couple of things. One thing, just a story he told me, a couple of stories he told me across the dinner table at the Palmetto Church of God when we were visiting Brother Terry and Sister Cindy uh, for the weekend there when they were in Palmetto. One of them was, he was telling me about when he was in a, a building program, and he had been there working all day long, and some of his church members drove by in their bass boat on their way to go fishing when he was working yeah, and he got aggravated, and uh, I believe the story went, he started to come down the ladder and uh, let him know that he was aggravated, but then God spoke to him, he says, you're not working for them, you're working for me. Right. And uh, <laughs> we were in a remodeling project at Samoset a while back, uh, three or four years ago, and my members not only passed by in the bass boat, but they came back by after the fishing trip to show me the fish that they caught. <laughs> yeah. And at that moment, the words of S.J. Davis came to my mind. He said, you're not working for them, you're working for me. Right. And so I appreciate uh, Brother Davis so very much. We've been connected with his family for so long. Uh, he married my mom and dad 53 years ago at the Bellevue Church of God. And another story I'll end with this, and something that stuck with me through the last seven years of pastoring. He said, uh, as, at that time I was just going in, going to be a, a youth pastor, not too long after that, full-time ministry. Um, but he said, he said, son, let me tell you what the secret of ministry is all about. Now I'm sitting there, and he's always been a general in the, in the army of God for me, so I'm waiting for this great profound statement he's just going to give me. And I'm just excited that I'm the one that's going to get to receive it. He said, the secret to it all is this. The secret to it all is not really a secret at all, but the secret is prayer. That's it. And, uh, you know, we, in the church world today, we've come to do a lot of things very well, but we're not praying very well. And uh, the reason the church is in the place that it is today is because the house of prayer has become more of a house of singing and preaching and feasting instead of fasting. But 
uh, I appreciate the generals in the Army of God and they're the privilege to be able to come and be a part of this service today. We love you, Sister Davis, and uh, this whole family. Thank you. Yes. Davis was a man who was pretty blunt. He was helping us build the stage for the first tent that Brother Mary Mason and I were to put up in December of 1987. Brother Rice came and was so generous to dedicate that. But we were out there working on the stage, getting things so we could assemble it and disassemble it. And I was trying to help. But finally, he stood up from bending over, nailing or doing what he was doing, and his head went to bobbling again. And he said, Son, it's a good thing God called you to preach. Or you can't do anything else. <laughs> he went right back to work. <laughs> he was right. But what I do remember most is he was a man of great convictions. Yes. Strong conviction. Yes, he was. But he was a man with a loving heart, compassion. And I was preaching for him in 1988 in October. He was staying there in the parsonage in Clewiston. And on Sunday morning, I had preached on hell, the city of wolves. And, you know, I, or that night I actually preached on that message about hell. And if you can feel conviction, you could feel it. People were moaning and just groaning, and I gave the invitation. There were several that came forward, but several went out the back door. And one of them was an 18-year-old young man in that community, a center boy, and sitting there with his girlfriend. And he left out of that meeting. But I'll never forget on Tuesday morning, Brother Davis, as mentioned already, was a very early riser to pray. And he knocked on my door. I was still in the bed there in Clueston, in the Parsons, and he knocked on my door. And I don't, will never forget the look on his face. A man that loved souls, that loved people, that, that had a compassion for the lost. And he had this look of horror on his face. He was so visibly shaken, and he said, Son, that young man that was there Tuesday night in the service that walked out and did not come and pray said he went over this morning to his girlfriend's home and took a gun and in front of her he took his own life. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a man so disturbed, so troubled, so broken. Yes. He was a man that was funny. He was a man that funny things happened to. And we all appreciate and laugh about it. But I can tell you, he was a man yes. that had a compassion for lost people. Amen. And there's one thing that I will never forget about this man of God. I told my wife, I said, he, he is a man. We talked about how wonderful a man of God he was and true blue. But I'll never forget that S.J. Davis was a man that had compassion for the lost. You, you take that on with you today. He has people in heaven right now. I don't know how things work there exactly, but I do know that it works this way. He's already met people that he won to Christ. Oh, that are there because of his prayers and his love and his ministry. Yes. And I'll tell you what, one of these days when we see him, we're also going to behold the fruit of his labor on this earth. Amen. He was a man who loved the lost. Amen. Amen. church that I pastored, 26 years old, Dr. Rice appointed me there. I followed Brother Terry Davis and got acquainted with his precious family. I've seen so many places, and yes, that's been some time ago. Pop Davis was one of the greatest influences of my life. And when we talk about faithful, 
We talk about the men of God. We talk about Brother Davis. Mom Davis, we love you all so very much. We appreciate you. And the words come to my mind when Jesus said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think that's who he's talking to today is Brother S.J. Davis. Well done, my good and faithful servant. God bless you. Amen. Different people to influence your life the way that He has. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to share this one last thought and then I'm going to move out of the way. I was in a real bad place in my ministry a few years ago. And uh, I was always real ambitious, a lot of zeal. A lot of people say they ran from the calling of God. I think sometimes I ran past mine. Well, I had pulled out, pulled away from uh, the church of God. And I knew that uh, God, that's where God had me at. But I was confused, didn't know what to do. was trying to follow the leading of the Lord, I thought. And I showed up at a church service. And he and Mama Davis were there. And during that service, he kept looking over at me, bobbing his head, looking at me. <laughs> Shaking his head. So I don't know what he was thinking. Well, I, I found out real quick after the service. He's, he walked straight over to me. He said, what you doing, boy? I said, well, I'm just trying to follow the leading of the Lord. He said, mm-hmm. He said, I got one question I want to ask you. I said, yes, sir, what is that? He said, are you in the will of God? And he poked me in the chest. And I paused for a second. He said, you ain't in the will of God. It took you too long to answer me. <laughs> you better get back in the will of God. I thank God I got back in the will of God. Amen. And I appreciate him. Amen. Daddy told me that when he passed away, that I had to sing this song.
raise our hands and give Him glory in this place. Yes, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. I feel God in this house. My what testimonies from these men of God and these family members. And I thought about, you know, when Brother Davis, you know, he said, you know, Dad wanted you to minister and preach. And uh, for several years, and I thought about, man, that was the highest honor that I could give. But I can tell you after hearing these ministers of the gospel, oh man, I feel like I, I'm just inadequate to stand here before this congregation and this family. I've got stories to tell you, just like these men of God have spoke to you about the times and the fellowship that I had with Brother S.J. Davis. He was one of my mentors. And he gave me advice that over the years at several churches as pastor, he kept me out of a lot of trouble because he gave me wisdom. And I honor him today. And Sister Davis, you also. Like I told you last night, I hold you in the highest regard with Brother S.J. Davis because I know you always were a team together. And I can say this, and also Brother Gene Rice, through some of the toughest times of ministry in my life, Brother S.J. Davis and Sister Mary Davis held my hand and was a friend to me. At one of the lowest times in my wife's life, Brother Jean Rice and Sister Betty Rice was a friend in difficult times. And I know that Brother S.J. Davis is reaping rewards in heaven yes. today because of his ministry and all the great things. I just want to say to this family, one day I'll be able to speak to Brother S.J. Davis again and tell him of what he really meant to me. But Sister Mary, I want to tell you and this family, Brother Terry, Brother Steve, Brother Elmer, I go right on down the line, all the girls, of what this family has meant to me and the love that you have shown me throughout my ministry. And I thought about, you know, if I was to ask, or if Brother S.J. Davis was here today at this point in this service, he would tell me one thing. He'd say, stop talking about me All right. and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He loved the gospel. As I was praying and asking God for the scriptures to give this congregation today, I was led to Psalms 46. In verse 1, where the Bible says, God is our refuge right, right. and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling Thereof. And then the Spirit of God directed me to Romans chapter 8, verse 35. 
Where the Bible declares this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded right. that neither death, right. nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which yeah. is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. Oh, glory to God. The Word of God is a comfort and a time of trouble. The Word of God is our strength. The Word of God is a sure foundation. And this family stands upon the Word of God. I love the Word of God. You see, today we are here and we are at a time of mixed emotions. I, I understand. The family told me, listen, this is going to be a celebration. But I'm not a novice. I understand, Sister Mary, you've lost something dear. Oh, God. And we've lost something dear. And we are here today and have mixed emotions. And on one hand, we have great sadness. And, uh, you know, sadness not for Brother S.J. Davis uh, because uh, he is in a far better place, uh, but sadness because we have lost a dear loved one. Right. But on the other hand, there is great joy this day uh, knowing that because of the relationship that Brother S.J. Davis had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right. Come on. Oh, that he is in paradise. Right. right. He is in a place called heaven. Come on. He is in a place that I long to go. Right. And I thought about this. I shared this with Brother Elmer uh, 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 last night. And I asked a question, and we all have asked a question. Uh, why, a mighty man of God, I know you've asked the question, Sister Davis, uh, why God, at the very last days of a life of a man so powerful, a man that has preached the gospel, a man that has laid hands on the sick, uh, a man that has done great and mighty works for God, uh, why would a man have to go through what he went through? Uh, why would uh, our God allow His mind to be far off? Uh, but I'm here to tell you, and Brother S.J. Davis would tell this family this today, uh, that without God, I'm nothing but a piece of clay. Uh, without God on my side, uh, I am nothing uh, oh, but the dust of the earth. Uh, without God, uh, I can do nothing. And I believe God was reminding us, uh, that every great thing uh, that I have done uh, through this man uh, is because uh, I loved him uh, and I love the people he ministered to. Uh, and I believe God let us know uh, all the day uh, that he's with me in paradise uh, and that all oh, the fight was worth it uh, and the battle was worth it uh, and he killed all uh, Hey, because Brother S.J. Davis held on, we can hold on. Yeah. We can make it. You see, there's no greater joy for a Christian than to be in the presence of the one who loved him. Come on. And whom he loves. Yes, he was addicted. Amen. He was addicted to the gospel. Uh, he was addicted to preaching the gospel. Uh, and he was the type of man uh, when you got discouraged, uh, he would say he would say it like this: "Gird up yourself uh, like a man uh, and preach the gospel." Amen. Uh, through a time when many uh, ministers would have said, "I'm through. Uh, I'm throwing the towel." Uh, he was a man to, uh, that told me. 
He said, have you done anything wrong? I said, no, sir. He said, square your shoulders. Pick up the Word of God and preach the Gospel. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Oh, glory to God. I can tell you personal stories about S.J. Davis. But I can tell you this day, he was a man that loved Jesus Christ, yes, his Lord. Lord. I, I, I can promise you this. The Bible said that the Lord Jesus Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. Forsake us. And I can tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ did not forsake Brother S.J. Davis, but He was with him. He is with us through the valleys, though we may not hear His voice all the time, though we may not feel even the presence around us all all the time. I'm going to tell you we serve a God that is with us. And the story, oh how that the man wondered where God was when I was all alone and he saw only one footprint in the sand. We realize that that's the time that our God was carrying us. He was leading us only, man. I can tell you he was there to the very end and he called S.J. Davis home. I like what the Bible says in John 14 and 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. I thought about this scripture. There was a disciple named Thomas. And he said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right. You see, today, there's no way to make it to heaven except through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And we have a promise. And Brother S.J. Davis had a promise. Uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, that promise is we don't have to fear death. Uh, I preach Sunday morning. Glory to God, Brother Davis. I preach the tomb has lost its terror. Uh, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we do not have to fear the sting of death. Uh, oh, glory to God. Uh, I can tell you, I love honey. Uh, but I, I, you know, I don't go out there in a beehive to get honey. Why? Uh, because I fear the sting of death. Uh, or the sting of a bee. Amen. But I can tell you, you take the stinger off of a bee and I will enjoy all the honeycomb I can feel up on. Oh, praise the Lord. May I tell you, for a child of God, Jesus has took away the sting of death. He has took away the fear of the grave. Amen. Yeah. Glory to God. Oh. I can tell you, we're troubled. In this life when we don't know what's going to happen when we die. But Jesus has taken that fear out of dying. He has conquered the grave and death. So there needs to be no fear in our eternal future. May I tell this family that Brother S.J. Davis has not, oh glory to God, has not went to a place where there is any fear. But he's in a place of no fear. <laughs> he's in a place of, 
love. And I love the scripture uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, uh, For we know that if our earthly uh, oh, tabernacle uh, were dissolved, uh, we have a building of God uh, not made with the hands of man, uh, eternal in the heavens. Amen. Uh, I can tell you, Pop Davis, this morning uh, or this uh, evening uh, is in the hands of God. And he has a building of God. Not made with the hands of man. Matter of fact, Brother S.J. Davis's life is not over. Come on. Sister Mary, it's just begun. Hey, Amen. Uh, glory to God. Brother S.J. Davis has shed the temporary uh, for the eternal, uh, the tarnished for the spotless, uh, the passing for the everlasting. Uh, yes, our earthly bodies die. Uh, however, our heavenly bodies endure for all eternity. Uh, I like what 2 Peter 3 and 8 says. Uh, it says, But beloved, uh, be be not ignorant of this one thing. He said, a day with the Lord yes. is as a thousand years. And one day, oh, a thousand years is it one day with our right. Lord? Right. You see, time means something to us. Yes, but God holds time in right. His hand. Amen. Everyone here knows that it was Brother S.J. Davis's desire to go home to be with his Lord Amen. and his home eternal. Amen. His family. Oh, glory. His adopted family. Amen. Praise the Lord. Christ said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I think trouble was the last thing on his mind when he gave up the ghost and the Lord took him home. Sister Mary, I believe glory to God he could look out and remember the scripture oh, in yeah. the book of Revelation where it said, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. I like what it continues to say there in Revelation 21 and 4. It said, there shall shall be uh, no more pain. Uh, right. For the former things have right. passed away. Amen. Yeah. And, oh, glory. Where the frustrations of life are replaced with unspeakable joys. Where the pains of life are not permitted and the failures of life control us no longer. A place with no more pain. You see, heaven has no handicapped parking places. Can you say amen? amen? There are not pharmacies. There are not prescriptions to be filled. Matter of fact, heaven doesn't have hospitals or nursing homes. Amen. Right. Glory to God. Right. Hallelujah. I'm a good man to shout. Right. Oh, a place of paradise. All the days of hates and pains for Brother S.J. Davis are over. Right. The trips to the doctor have ceased. And yeah. all his pain has ended. that you that was given today is what God did in your life through a man named S.J. Davis. I, I got a man back there that I had breakfast with that drove over 400 miles. He's not a preacher. He's just a layman in the oh. church. But because of S.J. Davis, Brother Dale Shirsey back there was born into the kingdom of God. He drove from the state of Florida to pay his respects yeah, to a man of God. Yeah. I can tell you, I wonder if I just said who has been impacted by the ministry of Brother S.J. Davis. Stand, I imagine this whole congregation would stand. 
And I think about, I was praying last night, I was tossing and turning in my bed, and I, I can tell you, I had dreams last night, it wasn't bad dreams. We were having church, I was preaching, glory to God, and, and the power of God was moving. I even thought about, my goodness, wouldn't it be something if Brother Davis stood up or sat up in the casket, I told somebody that, and they said, well, if he done that, I'd make a new door out of this church. Amen. But I can tell you, they did it in the Bible. Oh, praise the Lord. Come on. It's happened in the Bible. Man had already begun to stink. God raised him up. Jesus raised him from the dead. You say that was Jesus. Oh, my Bible said, the works that I do, greater works shall ye do. Oh, he went to the Father and the, he prayed to the Father. I pray you send him a comforter. And that comforter, he's not just going to be with them, but he's going to be in them. I'm so glad. Glad that I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life. The Holy Ghost leads me and guides me. I've thought about this. Oh, the scripture where it talks about for the Lord Himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout. Yeah. Oh, glory to God. I don't know, you know, that may, you may be able to look that up and have a different uh, definition of that, but I just think about the Lord coming back as a true Pentecostal uh, and having a shout on the clouds of glory. Uh, amen. And I thought about this, I thought about the voice of the archangel. Can you think about it right now? As Jesus walks over and he looks at Michael, the archangel, and he says, Michael, oh, I know you can handle a sword. I know you can handle war. But as any of them angels of yours know how to play a trumpet, amen. I believe, my, I'm just, just bear with me. I, I, I had a good time last night in the motel room. Oh, with the Lord. And I thought about Michael saying, yes, sir. I've got some boys that can blow a trumpet. I thought about this. If the Lord would go over to Gabriel and say, Gabriel, I wonder can you prophesy unto the wind like Ezekiel did when Ezekiel took. And the Lord went to him and said, can the Bones live again. Come on. Right. And he said, Lord, you know us. Thou know us. You know where they live again. He said, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy unto the wind. Glory to God, Brother James Scott. The Bible said that he's going to come back with a shout. And the voice of the archangel. I wonder if an angel is going to step out and say, I prophesy to the wind. Oh, let the bones of every dead saint of God rise up again.
steps out on the portals of glory. Right on. Come on. And the voice of the archangel is going to say something. Yeah. Oh, glory to God. How, I don't know what it, they're going to say. Amen. Brother Rich, you said they're going to shout hallelujah because it's the same in every language. But when he steps out, he's going to say something and the bones are going to come back to life. And S.J. Davis is going to come back to life. Oh, hallelujah. Woo! Oh, won't that be a hallelujah? I love that song. There ain't no grave. I'm going to hold this body down. I've got to learn that. But I thought about how the voice of the archangel, the trump of God's going to sound. He's going to sound the alarm and we're going to stand up the armies of God. Yeah. The ones that have been enlisted as children of God. I wonder today, let me ask you this question. Brother S.J. Davis, certainly. If I'm going to pay him respect, and the ministry's respect. I've got to ask this question. Are you in the army of God this morning? Are you serving God with all of your heart? All right, come on. Are you going to be a part of the great rapture of the church that's about to take place? Wow. I can tell you if you're not a member of that army today, S.J. Davis can have one more crown. Glory to God for at His homegoing service. You can accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You can submit yourself, repent of your sins, and ask Him to wash you in His blood. And your sins will be cast into the sea of forgetfulness, yes. never to be remembered anymore. And His blood will cleanse you from all sin. You say, Brother Thomas, I don't know. I've been so mean. I've been so bad. I can tell you it doesn't matter whether you are a preacher's child, grandchild. It doesn't matter where you were raised. Sin can grab your life. Three years ago, we sat and our boy had made an awful mess of his life and he got hooked on drugs and drew his hair down long and just a, an awful shame. And I wondered, I said, oh God, sometimes I wonder, is there any hope? But I can tell you that you've not went too far that the Lord Jesus Christ can't rescue you. All right. And I thought about this. I, he was hooked on drugs. I mean, every drug you could think of, he was hooked on it. And I remember when he came to his mother and me, and he was crying. He said, I need help. I can't do this on my own. I need somebody to help me. Yeah. I, we said, son, we're going to get you some help. But the one that can help you more than anyone else is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, uh, he ended up in a place called Penal. When we left him in that place, snow was falling on the ground. Uh, but I can tell you it wasn't long that the calls, after he was able to call us, uh, the calls began to come in and said, uh, listen, I give my life to Jesus Christ. Uh, I am not a drug addict any longer. Uh, I am delivered from drugs. Amen. Lord, it wasn't long. He said, I've been sanctified. And then he said, Sister Mary Davis, I, I, God has filled me. Jesus has filled me uh, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, Come on. And next month, uh, he will be back here in Cleveland uh, receiving his license uh, for chaplaincy uh, and be graduating uh, with a cap and a gown. Uh, I'll tell you, God can rescue a soul uh, and God can rescue you this morning. Our God is able to take a drug addict and make him a fanatic. He's able to take a pimp on the road and make him a preacher. He's able to take the worst. I love 
the statement, Brother Jairus, I suppose it came from Brother Gene Rice. It's attributed to him. God takes the punks and the skunks and the drunks and he makes something out of them. Hallelujah. I can tell you that's what we are to do. And in close, and I thought about this. Brother Terry or Brother Elmer talked about fishing on Sunday. Was it you talking about he never fished on Sunday? I can tell you, when I was a sinner, I fished on Sunday. You know what? I'm still fishing on Sunday, every Sunday, somewhere. I'm still fishing. I just changed bait. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just changed the way I fish. I still fish every Sunday. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But I changed from looking, trying to fish for fish. And I started fishing for men. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And because of the ministry of Brother S.J. Davis, he has encouraged me to go on. Right. Every time I want to quit, Sister Mary, I hear that man's voice saying, get up. And go a little farther. Today you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have him. And you can see Brother S.J. Davis again. Grandchildren, there's only one way to see him again. In his new body. And that's you've got, you must be born again. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Friends, Ladies and gentlemen here today, we respect this man of God. But you'll never see him again unless you've been born again, washed in the blood. Let us pray. Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for the life of Brother S.J. Davis. And God, I'm looking so forward to heaven and the place of paradise that you've prepared for us mansions that you have built by thine own love and mercy. Now, Lord, I pray that if there's one under the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, O oh God, that you would save their souls, that the Spirit of God would draw them one more time to a place of prayer and repentance and asking and calling upon the name of the Lord. For I know that you still save. Go with us. Keep us this day. And let us remember that you are the reason of the ministry and the success of Brother S.J. Davis. In the name of Jesus I ask. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. By special request, I'm going to ask the family to join me on the platform in the choir and sing this song, Oh, I Want to See Him. All of the family, would you please join me in the choir? We'll hold it to the entire family. for it being a little lengthy, but we have trimmed off everything we could. And I know there's so many more here who would like to say something. If you want to say something, join with us at the grave side in a few minutes. There will be food prepared here at the church after the burial. We invite you to come. Thank you for all of your kindness. All of the cards, all of the flowers, everything that's been shown to the Davis family. We appreciate you so very much. You that have traveled a long ways, thank you. We know the impact that this family has on your life here. And uh, this particular song, there's a phrase at the end of it that he really loved. And Sister Davis really loved. Cares all past, home at last, ever to Rejoice. Oh, yes. Now, Mother Davis told me, said, Son, let's have church. Yeah. I said, If I've got anything to do with it, Mother, we're going to have church. You don't want to. Matter of fact, he stopped. Brother Davis had stopped before and said, Y'all going to drag this thing to death? And y'all going to go, Okay, let's bury it. Let's have church. Would you?
Would you stand with us and sing along with us? As I journey through the land, singing as I go.
What a tribute. Cares all past. Home at last. This family will testify to you and tell you this. If they ever heard him say anything at all, he said this, Sister Rice, I just wish the Lord would come. After his prayer, I just wish the Lord would come. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I've heard him say that over and over. I just wish the Lord Say it to Christ, full of the Holy Ghost, encouraged by it. Hold your hand high. 